My beloved sisters and brothers in Christ, what a day this is. What a day this is. Maybe it is that this is a day of 95 degrees heat <laughs> because God knows something really hot's going on around here. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> what do you think? Oh yeah, I think we're feeling the fire of the Spirit. God keeps demanding that we make absolute choices, choose life or choose death. Sometimes we don't realize how high the stakes are. Sometimes we don't realize we're even making those choices. What we read in Deut Deuteronomy, choose life, how do you say that in Spanish? Choose life. Escoja vida. Esco Escoja vida. vida. How many of you, by the way, understood that in your original language when she read it? Just lift your hands. Okay. We have a few. <laughs> Woo hoo. That's a way, by the way, that we need to choose life, don't we, as a conference? We need to broaden our scope and make the choices that will make that possible to become a much more diverse conference. And so in Deuteronomy, we hear that. I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live. Loving the Lord your God, obeying him, and holding fast to him, for that means life to you and length of days, so that you may live in the land the Lord swore to your ancestors. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. So the Israelites are wandering in the desert. We are told it was 40 years they were wandering in this desert many of them longing to return to what they knew, which was, of course, captivity, enslavement, Egypt. But it was security, they knew that. But God's message is certain, I put before you life and death. Are you going to follow God with your whole life? Are you going to look first to God? Keep God's spirit at the center of all you do. Is this what you will do? Are you going to seek first and foremost God's yearning for you? Whatever the cost, or are you going to take the easy way? Are you going to cling to the now or worse, the past? Are you going to choose So what does it mean to choose life today? What does it mean in your own personal spiritual life to choose life? What does it mean in the life of the church, your church, to choose life? What does it mean for us as an annual conference to choose life? What does it mean for the general church to choose life? What does it mean at every level of faithfulness to choose life. What we need to do in order to, lose, to choose life is to let go of any baggage that's keeping us back, no matter how valuable that seems to us. In 1915, a small band of men, about 28, huddled on an ice floe near the South Pole. They had left a year earlier in order to be the first persons to ever set foot on the South Pole. And for nine months, they had been frozen in, unable to go forward, backward, or anywhere. And now this ice flow was beginning to shift and break up, and it was clear they were going to lose their ship called, by the way, the Endurance. Their leader said to them, we need to make some difficult choices. 
He said to them, you need to be able to give up, ready to give up anything that's precious to you that might keep us from surviving this terrible peril that we're in. And so he called them together and he said to them, think about what is absolutely essential to you for your survival and keep only that. And as they watched, he reached into his pocket and tossed out a huge handful of gold sovereigns onto the ice. And then he reached into his other pocket and he tossed out a gold watch and chain onto the ice. And then to their horror, he reached into his parka and pulled out a precious possession, a Bible that had been signed to him from Queen Alexandra and tossed even that onto the ice. And he said to the men, go back to the ship and take what you can carry on your backs. He said, the Pollock Island is 100, 350 miles from here. I think we can make it if we take only what we need. And so these men did just that. They packed only what they essentially had to have for this journey and pulled three 20-foot boats behind them over some of the most treacherous land on the whole continent. All 28 survived that journey because they were willing to give up all that wasn't essential. It wasn't always that way. In 1840, another group of adventurers, some 140, were led by Sir John Franklin toward the North, North Pole. And not one of them survived that journey. Why? They left on two huge ships, really large ships. Each one had an auxiliary steam engine. But even though they were going on a two-year adventure, they had only enough coal to power these auxiliary engines to last for two weeks. They, too, got frozen in. And they, too, obviously made an effort to find their way out of that. Through the years, their bodies have been discovered. And what they found along with these frozen corpses were such things as backgammon boards, gold jewelry, sterling silver, engraved sterling silver, and tea sets. They could not bring themselves to leave behind even the silverware. And they all perished. The words in Deuteronomy are, I set before you life and death, choose life. Be willing to give up everything to go where God leads. And so I ask again, what do we need to let go of in order to choose life? What personal and congregational baggage and keepsakes is Christ calling us to leave today so that we might follow him more closely as his faithful disciples? What is it that our Lord Jesus Christ, head of the church, head of the United Methodist Church, what is it that Jesus is calling us to leave behind? To toss off onto the ice so that we might live, so that we might have life, eternal life. Jesus makes those same demands to us today individually, I believe. Mark describes Jesus walking along the Sea of Galilee, seeing Peter and Andrew fishing, and Jesus says, come with me. I'll make a new kind of fisherman out of you. You can fish for men and women instead of perch and bass. And Mark reports the rest of it this way. He says, 
They didn't ask questions. They dropped their nets and followed Jesus. God lays a claim on each one of you, on each one of us. The wonderful good news is that God proclaims you are loved. You are loved with a love so great that nothing stands between you and God. You are forgiven. You are accepted. Your life is received and your future is open if you will but leave all of the baggage behind and follow where God calls. The claim on each of our lives is to decide. To decide where our values lie in a world that calls to us in so many ways that are, are not faithful. To decide, here I stand. I follow Jesus. And so God calls to us, each of us, to decide. And also to our congregations. It comes to every church. You can cling to every tradition, every remnant of the past, or you can sort out what is essential, what must be left behind to be faithful now, in this time, to boldly call where God is calling you. And every church must make this choice over and over and over. Once upon a time, there were six churches, sort of small to mid-size, in a very defined geographical area, not very big. Some of them were really struggling because if you multiply simply heating costs by six, you've got quite a number you're looking at. And so they began to do some things together and eventually somebody said, well, what could we do if we became one? And so a, a vision was cast. And it came to be. Four of those ch churches decided to become one. And today there's a beautiful sanctuary, up-to-date, accessible sanctuary where wonderful worship is taking place and a wonderful Family Life Center that is actually a center for the whole community. All kinds of events happen there. And wonderful classrooms where little children learn about Jesus and adults have a comfortable place to be and they even have indoor plumbing. <laughs> Did I say there were four of the six that decided that? So what about the other two? Well, you can almost tell me about the other two. They're really struggling. They are year by year an older congregation, year by year a smaller congregation, and it's been years since anyone has been received by profession of faith. Now, I don't want to be misunderstood. It is very possible for smaller churches to be incredibly vibrant, and we have them all over this conference. But sometimes God is calling us into a new place, a place that requires enormous sacrifice, a place where we're willing to give up stained glass windows and the pew where grandma sat and those sacred memories of all that took place there. Because you see, God can be present wherever the people of God desire to do whatever it takes to follow God. A study was done by the United Methodist Church this past year to examine the question, what makes a vital congregation? What is it? And here's what they came up with. That there is inviting and inspiring worship. Worship where something exciting and inspirational happens that there are engaged 
disciples in mission and outreach. It's a church that looks beyond the walls and is reaching out into the community and beyond. That there are gifted, equipped, and empowered lay leaders in the church. Laity who really understand that it's their church and they're the ones called to be the church. And they're given authority and possibilities and training and vision. And there are effective, equipped, and inspired clergy in leadership, that the pastors are leading with authority and with a vision. And there are small groups, small groups for adults to learn how to be a disciple, small groups for children and children's programming and youth ministry. Some of our churches have this, you have it in your DNA. You get it, you understand this. Some of our churches desperately want to do what it takes, but don't have a way forward. To be the church which is alive requires risk. It requires creating welcoming and inclusive outreach into the community. And it requires a willingness to be committed to growing disciples that is continuing the process of discipling from the cradle to the grave. And so not only do we need to hear this call as individuals, not only do we need to hear it as local churches, but we must hear it as an annual conference. Our churches are indeed challenged, but not only our churches, we, the conference, are challenged. The challenge comes to us as a Susquehanna conference. God calls us to make hard decisions as a conference. What will we toss out? What baggage are we carrying? What do we need to leave behind and to give up? We're in a new day. We can't do what we've done for years and years and years. We too are called to toss out our gold coins and our gold watches and our cherished possessions. We've been taking a careful look at how we do our work as a conference and we've called this as we create a new conference an unfrozen moment. And so we come to this place with the way the Wyoming conference always did things and the way the Central Pennsylvania conference always do, did things, but we can't do those anymore. We're a new conference. So what does that mean? Amen. Let's... Let's hope this new conference follows God's way. And so we've created a visioning leadership team that's made up with clergy and laity and and it's been exciting to see the gifts of these folks come together. And so they're helping us create a vision of the new conference. You'll hear some about it at this conference, and next year you'll hear even more. You know that at this conference we're going to talk about whether the faithful, life-choosing future for our conference is to change the way we organize our districts. That proposal is before you. And change the way our district superintendents do their work. The question is, can we dare to change the way we lead in order to allow our district superintendents to do what they're truly called to do, which is to guide churches in vitality and to empower gifted clergy and lay leaders? If this proposal is approved, what we'll do is establish a full-time cabinet position in leadership development, church vitalization, and new church starts. And so we'll have some person who's really working on all of those kinds of vital functions of the church, of the conference. We believe that this position is going to provide our churches with more adequate resources for making disciples. And then we're also proposing that we would engage elders in the management of districts. All of this would free up our DSs to truly be vision 
casters to work with you. We've already started some of that. Some of you are involved in uh, PLDs, one of those famous United Methodist initials, pastoral leadership development groups, an intensive mentoring kind of experience where you can improve skills in leadership. And we're hoping to do much more of that, to have the same kind of experience for available to laity. We think that realigning our resources will allow us to provide DS leadership to you that will be more focused on growing the church. So here's where we stand, by the way, as a church, as a conference, based on the 2010 statistical reports. And let me share with you first the challenging news. This is not the good news. Our membership as a conference dropped by 3% in 2010. Our worship attendance dropped by 4% in 2010. And our professions of faith dropped by 6% in 2010. Now let me tell you folks, you hear that and you realize we can't keep doing what we've always done. But what I want to share with you is there's some very, what I find to be very exciting good news. When we consider our mandate to make disciples, this is really good news. And when we consider our mandate to reach out into our communities, this is really very good news. There ha there, we had a 4% increase in adult Christian formation groups. Good news. We had a 5% increase in children's formation groups. Woohoo! And the total of all persons in all groups increased by 4%. So this is very, very good news. This, these are disciple-making occasions. And now, here's the even better news. In the number of community ministries in which your churches are engaged, we had a 20% increase. So give yourselves a hand. And because of this, in the number of persons served by our communities of faith, our churches, we had a 20% increase. So give yourselves a hand. Now, this is a total of 238, 748 persons that were reached for Jesus Christ because of what you're doing in your communities. So when we say to you, get out of the walls of your congregation, you are hearing that and you are doing it. What we've learned is those are ways in to relationship with Jesus Christ. And I hear the anecdotal stories. A person who showed up at a shoe bank to get shoes for their kid, get, engages with, in a conversation, and then shows up, comes to worship, and then makes the connection. That, those are the avenues in to faith communities. All over the conference we report, we hear reports of shoe banks, of stores giving clothing and other goods, of tutoring and after school clubs, of free kids fairs and Easter egg hunts and hubs all over the conference, drawing in people who help to support Mission Central. And so I hope that during this conference you will find someone else from another church, another district, and talk about what's happening in your church and learn from them what's happening in theirs. It's this incredible opportunity we have here to share the good news of our ministries. We as a conference are learning that we must boldly go where we've never been before. We have to break out of the molds of what we've always done and we need to surrender some of the ways of doing church and follow where God leads. Now this is happening also at the general church level. The whole United Methodist Church is moving boldly into an unfrozen time. 
There will be significant changes, I suspect, at General Conference next year in how we organize our general church agencies. We're also working throughout the denomination to increase our accountability, church, local church accountability, pastor's accountability, bishop's accountability. That's expected in any other enterprise throughout society. Why in the church do we let us get off with giving the Lord only half of what we can do? There's a clear choice. We can choose to follow where God leads, whatever the risk, or we can live a protected life that's very comfortable and has no future. God has always called God's people into challenges that are so great they cannot be accomplished without God's help. I think we're in one of those times. Our theme for this historic second Susquehanna Conference is what the river flows. This beautiful Susquehanna River that with its tributaries comes from all over this conference. From these many sources becomes a majestic, beautiful, life-giving river. So now let's look again at these people that God called out of slavery in Egypt. In that passage from Joshua, they've wandered for 40 years. In spite of hardship, in spite of everything that happened, they finally can see the promised land. And now they're told in the passage we read from Joshua, and the Lord said to Joshua, today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel, so they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, when you reach the edge of Jordan's waters, go and stand in the river. Now some of us who have been to Israel wonder, what's the big deal? The Jordan's not that big. Well, remember, this is two, what, 4,000 years later, 3,000, I'm, I'm, three, three about, okay, what is it? Three, how many say three? <laughs> it's a long time ago, folks. <laughs> and it was a big river. And not only that, we're told that it was, it was at a time of flood. And so it was even a bigger river, kind of like what we see some of you are experiencing, and others of us have simply seen it on TV, horrible, horrible flooding. Vast, a small river turned into a vast, vast river. And so that's what we're talking about. That was what the Lord told Joshua to cross. But he didn't say cross at this point. He said, just go stand in that river and trust that there will be a way. A river that's too wide and too deep to cross, it's impossible. Isaiah reminded us, fear not, I am with you. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, you will not be overwhelmed. I will be with you. And so our spiritual ancestors dared to take the Ark of the Covenant, God with them, the symbol of God with them, and stand in the river. And what happened? The river parted and they crossed into the promised land. That's, that's where we are, my friends. <laughs> We're standing at the edge of a river, and many of us are saying, well, it just, it's impossible. It can't be done. But with God, all things are possible. So I challenge you to step into the river. Step into the river. With God's help, we can. By the grace of God, by the love of God, by the presence of God, we can do it. Amen? Amen. Amen.